What's up, my wizards? It's Dev from SBMTG, the place with the decks, and if there's one thing you should know about me, it's that I am a man who takes a challenge very seriously. I am. The other day there was a guy in the comments who has a joke was like, do Mono White Eldrazi, huh? Do it, yeah. And this other guy was like, let's see what you did there, buddy. There it is. You can read it. It's right there. Um, and you know what? I can do it. It's totally possible. That is a challenge that is doable, I think, in this format. You're like, what? Blah? Yeah, it totally is. I, I try Trust me, we can do this. This deck is based on the White Black Eldrazi that's going around right now. That's a really cool deck. If you haven't heard of it, I'll give you a little bit more about that um, towards the end of the video. But what options are available to us if we cut the black? What do we have just in Mono White? 18 creatures in our Mono White Eldrazi deck. That just, it never gets old. Like, it's always fun to say. Mono White Eldrazi. We have a couple of things right on the very low end of the curve that aren't available to us in, say, the, the White Black Eldrazi deck I was just telling you about. Um, starting off, though, with four copies of Night of the White Orchid. This thing is really, really good in this deck. It ensures that we get a land drop on the draw, that's really, really good. You know, you don't see a card that's good on the draw every day, much less a deck that wants to play like huge 10 power or 10 mana dudes. Um, that one, that's good on the draw. This deck does a lot of stuff good on the draw. It's very reactive, you know. Um, but this card, again, just awesome. It's a form of ramp in some in some ways. If you play it right, that's really good in this deck. And covers the early game for us really well. Again, some of the smaller creatures in the format, which there are a ton of right now. So just everything about Night of the White Orchid, I think, works for this deck right now, you know. Also on the lower end of the curve, it's in a lot of sideboards. We're going to move it to the main deck. Three copies of Irish and Cleric. Irish and Cleric, like, yeah, I, I'll totally play this in the main deck. Like I said, we got to make it to the later game. And this is in, like, every sideboard um, for, for any deck that plays white. This is in their sideboard. So let's just move it to the main deck because we're playing against a lot of creature-based things right now. It's a really good blocker and will help our life total out early game. It's already Eldrazi time. Three copies of Blight Herder, four copies of Oblivion Sower, and three copies of Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger. Blight Light Herder, we can process things pretty easily. I'll get to that in just a moment. You've probably guessed already what we're doing, but it's not that hard to figure it out. And in cases of emergency, you know, he's a 4-5 body. There's nothing wrong with that either. Oblivion Sower, just a really a fundamental piece in the deck. Sometimes, very often actually, you'll play um, Oblivion Sower and then play the Blight Herder. And then Ulamog, you know, is Ulamog. He's just the biggest, baddest Eldrazi. Once you play him, you really, it, you kind of win the game, you know. It's just, it really, he's a two-for-one when you play him and you exile the two things, you know. And just when he swings, if he swings three times, you win the game. Or twice, really, you win the game. So, just, yeah, to Ulamog. It's the entire reason to even do this deck. If you're doing the math right, you may notice there's one more creature. I'm really excited to talk about this one. Um, hilarious in testing so far. Now, you know, Green Red Eldrazi gets to play their seven mana huge thing in Atarka. What do we get to play, you know? We get to play one copy at least. I'm thinking about bumping it up to two. Of Amiria Shepherd. <laughs> this is the card for this deck. Amiria Shepherd, we're playing a ton of planes. Obviously, we're mono white. We might as well take advantage of that. Anything that happens to go to the graveyard, we can get back with Amiria Shepherd whenever we make a land drop. We're playing 26 lands in the deck. That's a ton. We could actually play more. You know, the White Black Eldrazi deck plays 24 lands, and I don't understand that, you know. We'll definitely play at least the 26, if not 27 or even 8. We've got to make our drops. And um, just with an Amiria Shepherd, those drops become amazing. 14 spells in the deck. What are we exiling with? We actually have um, something like 16 cards in the main deck that exile, and then two more in the sideboard. So, yeah. Uh, we're playing four copies of Silk Wrap. Four copies of Stasis Snare and two copies of Quarantine Field to get things started here. This is just all the stuff that exiles, and the next card will exile too. I just, you know, these three cards seem like they all go together because they're all really similar. Um, also, we've got Oblivion Sower that exiles stuff for us, but obviously these things are a removal, early game removal for the most part. That's really, really important. Um, and obviously, Quarantine Field can go the distance. You know, we can play this for six mana. That's parity of Oblivion Ring. We get two things out of it. That's really good against a lot of the stuff in the format. Um, Stasis Snare and Silk Wrap just obviously help us cover the early game, especially Silk Wrap, which is just insane right now, you know, all the way up to Manus Rider, we can take out stuff, and Anafenza, you know, um, so just all, all three of these cards are absolute yeses for the deck. Two copies of Titan's Presence in the deck. Yet again, the deck is made for this. We're playing something like 10 Eldrazi in the main deck, all of which are pretty big, except, you know, Blight Herder can't take out a Siege Rider or anything if he's in your hand, but he can take out, like, pretty much anything else <laughs> in the entire format, you know, other than, like, other huge Eldrazi creatures. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The card isn't a great top deck later on in the game. We're not playing a ton of copies of it, you know. After we've already played our Eldrazi, it's not that great. So we don't want to play a ton of copies of it, but while we do have that Ulamog in our hand and we're waiting to play it, Titan's Presence is just... More or less unconditional removal. So, yes, absolutely. And it processes, you know, it exiles things for us. 
two copies of Planar Outburst in the deck. Obviously, you know, all of our Eldrazi are either at the same spot or higher than this on the curve. So the idea, obviously, is to just Planar Outburst and then go from there, you know, start playing your huge dudes after you clear the board. Um, usually it works nine times out of ten. And later on in the game, which is where we want to be, you know, we can awaken this to, to great effect. The awaken on this is insane. Um, so, yeah, just Planar Outburst. I don't see any reason not to play a board sweeper in the main deck. Even though we are playing Cleric and Knight of the White Orchid, you know, after they do their job, they're not that important for us. So, Planar Outburst, yes. And two Planeswalkers to finish off the main deck. Two copies of Gideon right here. Gideon is really good, by the way, the emblem at least, with uh, Blight Herder. You know, you're getting a ton of power if you have an emblem out, you know, with Gideon. And he's good just for everything he does, you know. He's good against mass removal, which we don't care that much about. But it does mean that he pairs very nicely with our own Planar Outburst. You know, we can play Gideon fourth turn, follow it up next turn with a Planar Outburst, make a dude with Gideon and just go from there, you know. Or swing him with Gideon himself. So Gideon's just so, he's too good not to include somewhere in a a wide deck, so here he is. But you don't have the money for Gideon. The deck is fairly cheap without him, and you know, Ulamog's gonna cost you money, but that's that's almost the only thing that costs huge money in the deck, you know. Um, so if you don't feel like playing Gideon, play like Retreat to Emiria, I could see that. Or you could play Hedron Archive, Hedron Archive, in the main deck. You know, I've got it in the sideboard to help us keep up sort of with other Eldrazi decks and with control decks, you know, we can draw cards, that's important. But you know, I've got Hedron Archive in the um, sideboard, but if you don't want to play Gideon, I could see playing Hedron Archive in the main. But you can also play Retreat to Emiria because we're playing a lot of lands, you know. 26 lands in the deck, and again, like I said, I can see cutting a card or two and, and adding more lands. Um, just because we have to get our drops, we have to get to Ulamog in, we have to um, play uh, Amiria Shepherd at some point, so, and, and keep playing lands <laughs> to make her good, you know. But the reason that these funky lands are in there, the Canopy Vista, the Prairie Stream, you know, um, the Smoldering Marsh is in there just to cover any fetch lands that you get that you can't use otherwise, you know. Um, and if you get a Wooded Foothills, you can get um, um, the Canopy Vista. And if you happen to get a Polluted Delta, you can do the uh, Prairie Stream, so you just, you're making white mana either way. So I felt like it was important to put these in, but if you don't have the, again, if you don't have the money for the Battle Lands, you can cut those and just use planes. It's totally, totally possible. Here's a sideboard. Look at it. We got a ton of options, you know. We can still play Irish and Cleric. We'll totally do that. Radiant Purge is awesome against, um, it could almost be in the main deck. A one of Radiant Purge, I, I really might want to do that because it takes out Manus Rider and offends that Siege Rhino, just some of the most important creatures in the format of Jutai when it swings, you know. So I could see a one of Radiant Purge. The Exile is awesome on Radiant Purge in this deck, so yeah. Um, and everything else, you know, uh, Citadel Siege is weird, right? Citadel Siege is mostly in there um, against, again, the Mirror Match is important because they're going to play their Ulamog a couple of turns or more before us, you know, so we've got to be able to do that, something about that, and Quarantine Field can take care of it on the next turn, Stasis Snare can take it, they take care of it at the end of their turn, you know, and Citadel Siege can tap it down. They played a lot of the Mirror Match, and this deck is tuned for that, um, but still it doesn't do great in Mirror. But it's really good against Abzan, and it actually has some decent game against Jeska, the, the three decks that I've played it against, that's it. Um, but I can see us having a problem against Aggro, but that's why a lot of this is against Aggro. we got, you know, more um, removal and more mass removal and stuff like that. What is this black-white Eldrazi jazz I was talking about earlier? I want to touch on that briefly here. The deck looks really good to me, you know. It um, is able to cut or move Gideon and Erish and Cleric to the side. And it also cuts, you know, Amiria Shepherd, obviously, and Knight of the White Orchid. In favor of playing um, Utter End for more exiles, and it's a really good card right now, Wasteland Strangler is super excellent. It gives us another processing effect, which is just... Wasteland Strangler is absolutely bomb. It's a really, really good card, and just makes the deck worth playing black in, you know. We also get access to um, Read the Bone, and Obnixillus, which helps us draw cards, and Obnixillus is just a good period, but mostly helps us draw cards so we can get our drops and just our important cards, you know. We don't have too much of that in this deck. Um, and I can see cutting um, a couple of things there. The, you know, a lot of these play four copies of Read the Bones. I don't, I don't know about that. Um, but <laughs> definitely the other end of the Wasteland Strangler, very, very powerful options for the black-white deck. And I don't have uh, power rankings for this deck yet. I, I, it wouldn't be fair, you know, I've only really played um, maybe a dozen games, you know, it's really not that much. I've played a few games against a couple of decks, and I just haven't really tested it enough to know um, what the power rankings are, though it feels like a mid-60s, <laughs> something like that. Just, it feels that way to me. Um, but I will, I'll, I'll do a little bit more, um, and I want you guys to test it out, because honestly, if you don't include the Gideons, um, it's just like a couple of hundred bucks, and if you take out the Battlelands, it's even less, you know, so it's not necessarily a budget deck, but it's, again, way cheaper than what you could be playing. I just did Sultai Aristocrats, or Sultai uh, White, and that was that deck is like seven hundred and something dollars. It's just insane. So this deck looked pretty pretty good for the price. <laughs>
That's all I got for this time. Marty Planeswalkers is definitely coming up next. I know it's supposed to do that next, but I just I loved this challenge and I loved what I ended up coming up with. It was just really, really fun to, to play with. So I hope you guys liked it. If you did, please just help us out. Hit the thumbs up button. That helps more than you can ever know. And then, you know, comment. I want to know how you feel about this one because I think it's a really, really cool deck and could do really well at an F&M and nobody's going to know what, what you're up to, you know. Um, so test it out. I think the deck is really awesome and a lot of fun. I'm Deb from SVMTG. As usual, thanks for watching, my wizards.